right. Hello, everybody. We're so excited. We have a really fun day planned. Um, welcome again to the Taking It Virtual series. Um, today's topic is going to be on how to adapt your virtual residency in senior centers. This is the third of four online sessions. So please be sure to check out the other topics that we've been covering throughout this week. My name is Danielle Stobie, and I'm the Arts Education Manager with Arts Fairfax, and I will be helping to moderate today's workshop. This session is being recorded, and we are working to have all recorded sessions available on our website. Go ahead and please check that you are muted. We will have time throughout the presentation for questions. At those times, if you would like to ask a question, please use either the raise your hand feature or um, you can do, there's little reactions in the bottom um, and I will unmute each person to be able to ask your question. If you don't wish to speak, you can also type your questions into the chat box with the name of your organization and I will help to monitor and ask those for you. If you are having any technical difficulties, you can email our information and technology manager, Karan, at K-B-A-N, sal at artsfairfax.org with your phone number and I'll also go ahead and drop that in the chat. I'd like to go ahead and start by thanking both Neighborhood and Community Services and Service Source. We're going to start with a couple of representatives to speak about the Fairfax County Virtual Center for Active Adults. Gwen Jones is a communication specialist with Neighborhood and Community Services and Kristen Roman who is the Director of Senior Services with Service Source. And we'll go ahead and start with Gwen. So Gwen, whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Um, like, um, like Danielle said, I work on the communications team for NCS and have been um, kind of with, uh, with the, um, the team that has built up the Virtual Center for Active Adults from the beginning. Um, I do a lot of the maintenance and the updating to the site. So I'm well versed in, in um, what it consists of. And today what I wanna do is I wanna just kind of do a show and tell of the site and kind of familiarize you with it in case you haven't visited it. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen to get started here. Um, okay, so this is the Virtual Center for Active Adults. Um, it was, you know, it all kind of sprang about because senior centers closed down uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but it's really kind of, the, the concept behind it is it was conceived to be a one-stop site to connect um, older adults and adults with disabilities to a wide variety of um, entertainment programs, services, and resources that are available to them. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it, the, what's made it possible is NCS has really partnered with a lot of um, agencies and organizations. Um, and, you know, our, our partners have allowed us agree to have our, have their content shared on, on our site. So, um, it, that's, I think, the, the success behind the site. Um, but if we walk through, uh, the virtual center basically is composed of a few key areas. And um, the first area is the events. And um, right up here up top, we have the spotlight events. And this is kind of an opportunity for us to really highlight any new programs we're offering any new classes, um, and also to highlight our partner events that might be of, you know, things that they want to really get out and publicize and get out to the public. So um, that is kind of our, our key area to really kind of have things at the top of the page and get the most um, attention and eyes on them. If we scroll down, um, you'll see all of these events. These are all the Virtual Center for Active Adults events. Um, it's, it's, it started off as, you know, um, a smaller group and 
since we've expanded our Zoom accounts, it's now a pretty robust programming that we're offering to folks. Um, and here, as we scroll down too, is where we get into our partners. And if you click on any of these links here, it connects to the, the events offered by our partner agency or organizations and agency. So um, not only can you find stuff offered by NCS and Service Source, you can find things offered by AARP and the library, uh, Mason Center for the Arts. So it's really kind of an opportunity to, to kind of be this one stop where people can just kind of browse and see all the things that are available to them. Um, if we scroll down even further, we get into on-demand programs. And with the on-demand programs, um, this is the on-demand page. And what you find here is a lot of videos that people can kind of watch um, on their own time at their own pace. And it's not only NCS um, and Service Source original uh, video programs and classes, it's also our partners. Um, so again, you know, we're really trying to make this site robust with not only our content, but our partner content. And then if we scroll back here, um, you scroll down, we get into services and resources. And some of these are a little more, um, you know, standard issue um, health and human services offerings for older adults and adults with disabilities. But then we also get into things from our partners that are a little more unique. Um, you know, technology help that people not, may not be aware of, um, a Teens United group that will deliver things to older adults um, for free, um, and just a lot of great resources that people may not be aware of, but re we're really trying to just kind of have it be found in this one one stop, you know, kind of place. Um, and if you continue to scroll, we have assistance from a distance. This is a, a Fairfax County wide um, service where anything and everything that you can um, access remotely from the county is all in this one spot. So it's, you know, whether or not this goes away after COVID, you know, it may prove to be such a, a useful thing that it sticks around. It's hard to tell at this point. Um, and then we scroll down more and self-directed activities. This is just kind of um, a compilation of kind of fun activities, educational activities, websites, resources that people can discover. And um, they're not necessarily, some of them are partner groups, some of them are just educational um, groups, um, nonprofits that have offered, you know, this robust um, kind of free uh, resources, you know, especially with, you know, COVID keeping everybody at home. So, um, this is just something that people can explore and play with if they want to and entertain themselves. Um, and it's just kind of something, this is actually where, where the website kind of originally began, where we were kind of pulling all these resources together for people to entertain themselves during COVID. And it just sprang into a much wider ranging um, offering when it became apparent that people weren't gonna be leaving their houses anytime soon. So. Um, and then at the very bottom, we have a listing and, you know, this is growing daily, weekly of our partner age, our partners that are um, adding content and um, joining us on the virtual center. So we actually have a few more I need to add, you know, in the next week or so, but um, just kind of giving them kind of credit and, and um, highlighting all these different groups that have really come together to try and um, provide this this unique and, and great resource for, for older adults and adults with disabilities in, in our community. And I think that's that's about it. And I think Kristen can um, speak more to the the actual programming that that we do. So I'll hand it off to her. Hello, I'm Kristen Berman from Service Work with uh, Senior Services. And I apologize in advance, my first grader is behind me, so I can hear things. I can try to keep as quiet as possible. Um, the so, uh, Service Source has a contract with 
partner with community services to provide recreation therapy activity support at the senior centers and case management. So when everything went virtual, um, we quickly kind of launched into um, doing the uh, activities online and creating the Zoom account. It first came from, um, you not hear me? Yeah, sorry, Kristen. I think the connection is a little bit off. So I think it's affecting the sound and then the speed. All right, let me try. Is that better? Yes, yes. All right. Bluetooth doesn't always work and this is what we learn on Zoom. Um, so we first launched the program starting with um, a lunch bunch social activities because one of the things that the senior centers did is providing um, lunches to uh, the seniors and delivering meals to them. And part of that, was a congregate meal program in person that they'd be social during um, that lunchtime. So that's how it all kind of started and quickly grew from that. So Gwen showed the um, website and I'm going to show the, our calendar from this week, just to kind of give you a visual. So. Just um, in the beginning of the month, we Any paint? Shh, I'm on a meeting. Go ask Uncle Matt. Um, the just this uh, beginning of October, we oh, we started two accounts. So first, we're using one account and doing a combination of exercise and um, discussion-based uh, groups and special events and things like that. And then just uh, in October, we've switched to two different Zoom accounts. So we have our Fit and Fab, which is all of our exercise activities, and then our social space, which is the lunch bunches, the discussion groups. Um, and so I will say the exercise classes is what draws the biggest audience. Well, in our Tuesday 1015 fitness class, we will have um, 80 to 90 participants. Um, and, and then it just kind of varies and we um, are starting and launching a new uh, body uh, stretching activity, chair exercise activities, and we're kind of constantly rotating based on participants needs and interests. And then for this is our social space account. So you'll see we've um, partnered with uh, Sarah and the arts for the aging and with a partnership through adult day healthcare. And we have one of their artists on tomorrow. Um, um, and uh, uh, and that has been an excellent uh, partnership and they come on every other um, week to give us um, some music, music and activities and the participants have really en enjoyed them. Uh, and so that's our kind of general activities. We have different, um, we've also learned that we need to offer a learn Zoom time. So we were offering Tuesdays and Thursdays um, for people to call in and we offered a telephone number, get on Zoom and walk them through the entire process of how do you get on? How do you, um, uh, how do you get on? How do you mute? How do you unmute uh, the basics? Because we found in the beginning that a lot of good 20 minutes of the meeting started was trying to explain that to the participants. So we made specific activities that they could learn everything at once and then go to the activities that they chose. Um, and so we've had a lot of learning. Um, our staff are learning how to do, as I'm sure a lot of you are, how to be able to play the music and talk and have everybody hear everything and the right connections. 
Um, and it's been a big growing experience, but they've, we've had lots of support from the participants um, and, and that has all gone really well. And so we're happy to share it. And I thank all of you who have partnered with us and um, able to share activities on our um, platform. That's been very helpful. Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you, Gwen. Um, I do see down in the chat, Curtis had a question. Um, do you have a budget for artists to present to seniors like music programs? Um, and I did want to touch on this just for a second. Um, one of the things that Arts Fairfax is uh, working on is partnering with neighborhood and community services um, to provide uh, some residencies virtually. Um, we're still working on details of that, um, but that's kind of a separate thing that if anyone is interested in that, um, I'll put my email in the chat and we can kind of talk offline about that. But Gwen or Kristen, I don't know if you wanted to touch on that. Um, it, it's something that we bring back to our um, NCS partners and normally each senior center has um, a budget. And so we just bring that back to um, Evan Braff, who's one of uh, NCS who's oversees the senior programming and kind of see where, what capabilities we have during this time. So I think there can be conversations and I think that's what you're doing as the, with the residency program. Great. And I think if we don't have any other questions um, directly to Gwen and Kristen, thank you guys again. We really appreciate um, everything that you're doing for Fairfax County and with the virtual center. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move over to our next group of presenters from Arts for the Aging. We're really excited. And I'd like to go ahead by starting to introduce our uh, next presenter, Janine Tersini, who is the director and CEO for Arts for the Aging. Janine is the leading force behind the organization's pioneering directions and its national recognition for best practices, program design, and outcomes. Under her tenure, Arts for the Aging has been named a model program in lifelong learning by the National Endowment for the Arts, a trailblazer by the Maryland Department of Aging, and one of the best DC area small charities for excellence, impact and cost effectiveness by the Catalog for Philanthropy. Arts for the Aging has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, on CNN News, and in the, in the award-winning national PBS documentary film, Do Not Go Gently. All right, Janine, you can take it away. Thank you, Danielle. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, um, so Sarah is going to be sharing uh, a set of slides. So I'm gonna wait for those to come up here before I begin. And, um, and as we're getting that loaded up, I wanted to uh, thank Arts Fairfax and also the Neighborhood and Community Services for, uh, for supporting the work of Arts for the Aging, for inviting us to be here today um, we've done some wonderful projects together in the past, and I'm just uh, delighted that we could join today and share what we've learned. Um, so I want to start by encouraging you all to feel free to use the chat function um, if you have specific questions. Sarah uh, House, who's my colleague, who you're going to hear from in a little bit, she's going to keep an eye out um, if any questions crop up that really need immediate addressing. Otherwise, we'll save them for a Q&A time that we have at the end. Um, so now I'd like to just give you a quick overview of what we're going to cover today during Arts for the Aging's presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and the mission of Arts for the Aging, some of our core philosophies, and about our reach and impact as well. And then a little bit about research around why arts participation is so vital in the lives of older adults and all of us as we, as we grow older. Uh, then Sarah is going to talk about how we've transitioned to virtual programs. We'll also take a five minute break. Uh, and during that five minute break, you'll see a little bit from a pre-recorded video of ours that, that should be nice and relaxing if you choose to stay in place. 
Uh, and then two of our teaching artists who are both PhDs, uh, Dr. Peter Joshua Burroughs and Dr. Carlos Cesar Rodriguez. Um, between the two of them, award-winning tenor and maestro pianist, they're going to give us a peek in, a look into one of their workshops, and we'll do that live. And then we're gonna have a guided discussion on how we transitioned to virtual programs and how you can too. And then we'll end with a Q&A for specific questions. Does that sound good to everybody? Okay. So let's see, I'm gonna advance this slide here. Make sure this works. You might need to request control of my computer again. There we go. Give this a moment. Okay. Give it another moment. All right, here we go. So this is a photograph of our founder. Um, Arts for the Aging was founded in 1988 by a renowned artist and scientist and philanthropist pictured here. Her name is Lolo Sarnoff. Uh, and she began the organization when she was 72 years old. And the idea cropped out of uh, the vision for the organization, really, not just the idea, but the true vision grew out of a, uh, her work with former colleagues at the National Institutes of Health. Um, they were studying an Alzheimer's uh, drug and they were studying this drug on people that were involved in an arts activity. And what they found was that moods and behaviors improved in the people with Alzheimer's disease in this study when they were involved in these workshops. And that oftentimes those mood and behavior improvements um, kept on even after the programs ended. So this was Lolo's aha moment where art and science really came together for her and she branched off and started the organization at that time. So 32 years later, uh, as we have learned more and more about the brain uh, in terms of health and science fields, um, they are finally catching up to what I think the artistic community, what Arts for the Aging, what you all as, as artists and arts practitioners have probably known all along. Uh, and that is that, oops, and that is that, sorry about the slides here, they're switching. Uh, that is that, um, that artistic engagement is good for the mind, the body, and the soul. I'm gonna try to change this slide now. Sorry, that was on me. I was trying to respond to chat and uh, took over control and moved your slide. Okay, so let's see. I'm not able to advance to the next slide here. Let me try again. Okay, all right, here we are again. So um, with this idea that the arts are healthy for the mind, the body, the spirit, the imagination, we also know that it promotes joy and connection uh, and this is the heart of our mission. So what is our mission? Uh, the mission of Arts for the Aging and you might, um, you might hear us referred to as AFTA. We used to use our acronym quite a bit. So if any of us kind of switches into that mode, uh, we're trying to get out of that habit, but um, we typically go by Arts for the Aging. Our mission is to engage older adults and caregivers in health improvement and in life enhancement through regular participation in the multidisciplinary arts. So we're not just focused on one art form. And these workshops are therapeutic and participatory by design. We have a faculty of teaching artists, two of whom you'll meet today, as I mentioned. Uh, we have 25 of them and they're in visual performing and literary arts. We employ them and train them to work in community and residential care settings throughout the greater Washington region. And what I mean by community and residential care settings is a, uh, it's a range. Uh, there are senior centers where we lead these programs, community centers, adult day centers is a real sweet spot. We have a lot of adult day centers on our roster. Uh, memory care programs, uh, continuing care retirement communities, which might include assisted living communities and independent living communities, memory cafe programs. Uh, we have also partnered with museums and cultural institutions who have had some in-gallery workshops. Uh, and 
So it's a range of communities that benefit from these uh, programs. And uh, one of the pieces that works really well, what, that has always worked really well for our program is that our program and our teaching artists are going to where older adults already live or attend programs. Um, and this happens throughout the greater Washington DC region. Our office is headquartered in Rockville, but the programs happen throughout greater Washington. And we envision with this, um, with these virtual platforms that we that we will more readily expand our footprint beyond this region in the months and years to come. Back to changing slides again. I went too far. Okay. So in terms of the audience that we provide these programs for, uh, these stats have to do with the older adults that are in our workshops. And you can see that participant demographics really range. Uh, and so for these reasons, um, these reasons of diversity in our programs, it's really about using an art form as an entry point, as Peter has often said. An entry point, you using your art form as an entry point to spark conversation and connection, um, to give people a sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. And really the arts are about accessible and uplifting ways that we can cope uh, with changing abilities that come with aging in terms of working with older adults. And the way that Arts for the Aging works in terms of uh, with whom we partner, we are providing financial aid to communities that couldn't otherwise access these programs. And we do that through the, philanthrop through, through the philanthropic support that the organization receives. But then we also partner with communities and, and, um, and clients that can contribute to or pay for the services in whole. All right. Yay, I did a slide change smoothly. So this overview of statistics here, um, in this slide, this is really a deeper dive um, into the abilities and the impairments that we see uh, in, in the programs and in the groups that we are providing these programs for. So in a typical workshop, we'll be, we'll be with between 10 and 20 older adults and caregivers. And caregivers typically have been professional caregivers when our programs were in person. Uh, and now we're seeing uh, family caregivers join in some of our programs, which we're delighted about. We've always wanted um, to, to reach closer into uh, 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 caregiver communities and family caregivers are important to us. So we're seeing more of them in our programs now. Um, so, because there's such a range and diversity of abilities in our programs um, and abilities are unconventional or they're changing, they're diminishing as, as we age, um, the fact that artists have this natural kinship with improvisation and, and the use of imagination, it's incredibly useful to serve diverse populations of older adults. And so another part of this slide uh, is kind of showing you how we measure impact. And this is of course important to funders. And so we're looking for, going back to the study that I mentioned earlier, we're looking for those mood and behavior improvements. And, um, and so we're looking pre-workshop and post-workshop how people are interacting with one another and what their moods and behaviors are. So you can see that we're looking for participation levels. We're looking for and documenting if people are sharing stories. And those stories can be imagined or remembered. It's, it's really, um, there are no wrong answers here. It's really about validating uh, whatever is put, put forth, and that's um, very, uh, makes people feel very whole, particularly for people who are losing their memory, that, uh, that their contributions are validated and accepted no matter what they are, linear or not. And so this contributes to diminishing feelings of isolation and loneliness and igniting self-expression and joy. And there's also an evidence base behind this work. Um, so when humans interact, uh, we know that dopamine increases and um, dopamine is the brain's chemical messenger and it carries signals uh, between our brain cells. We also know with human interaction that oxytocin increases and that's our love and well-being hormone. And this reduces, this helps to reduce perceptions of pain and anxiety and it can amplify emotional response. So these are chem chemicals working in our, in our bodies and our minds as we're interacting with one another. So this is uh, fertile, fertile territory to be working in. And these, these programs, the evidence base also shows that there's stress relief because of these programs and improved blood pressure and heart rate. On this next slide, 
as I'm talking about evidence base, um, this is the landmark study in the field of what we call creative aging, the field of creative aging. And we're going to share these links, by the way, you know, after I finish up um, chatting, uh, we'll, we'll put a number of links um, related to some of these studies that I'm and articles that I'm going to mention in the chat box. So stay tuned for those. But meanwhile, in this seminal study, uh, we had an intervention group. When I say we, it wasn't me, but the, uh, the researchers had an intervention uh, group that was a chorus. And the control group just continued on with their regular activities. This is uh, older adults um, involved in a chorus over the period of a year. And what the study found was that the um, intervention group, those that were in the chorus, they actually reduced their medication usage. Um, they had to visit the doctor less. Uh, their scores improved on depression scales. And they even took part and found themselves increasing their other activities. Um, and so all of this goes towards reducing risk factors that drive the need for long-term care. So this was a really important study. Uh, Americans for the Arts, um, I found something uh, on their website. Again, this is a link that we'll share. Um, social impact, they have something called the social impact wheel. It's a really interactive um, way to find out how the arts uh, impact different populations, not just older adults. Uh, but I found in that um, social impact wheel, a study that showed that as little as 10 weeks of visual arts participation makes the brain stronger. It increases, it increases the brain's resiliency and neural connectivity, and it makes for better self-awareness and memory processing. And then last year, the New York Times, uh, the headline that was published was asking if dance is the kale of exercise. I love that. They cited multiple studies uh, in this article. Again, we'll share this in the, in the chat. Uh, a German report, Frontiers in Human Neuroscience, reported that engagements in interval training or social dance, that while both activities increase the size of the hippocampus, uh, which is the brain region for learning and memory and equilibrium, um, that only dance improved balance between those two. And then out of McGill University in Canada, uh, older adults that were involved in long-term tango dance um, that they were associated with, they were associating with better bait, gait and balance. And this leads to falls prevention. So this is really important stuff. Um, in terms of, it's time to transition. I'm gonna let Sarah take things over in just a moment. And I just wanted to add that there's so much um, beauty in this work. Uh, and I know that the artists come out of this work feeling more whole. Uh, so there's this incredible give and take um, in, and there's an amazing amount of nurturing in this kind of work. So it's replenishing and, and I'm, I'm just delighted that we're here to talk with you today and encourage you to be working with older adults. Um, so once, this, once the pandemic hit earlier this year, we were actually amidst hiring a new program director. Uh, and so we, um, during a, a period of time when all of our programs were canceled, we actually quickly instituted continuing pay for our artistic faculty despite those canceled programs because we just felt it was so important to keep that um, safety net alive for the teaching artists uh, who are the heart and soul of the organization. And then Sarah joined us um, just this past spring uh, in the beginning of the pandemic and really um, hit the ground running, helping us uh, transpose what we have always done in person into virtual programs. So Sarah has actually only ever seen us um, in, in virtual mode. Um, so I'm delighted to, to introduce Sarah now and let her take it from here. And um, thank you again for letting us be here. Okay, gotta click all the buttons and remove Janine's spotlight. So thank you, Janine. Yes, and every time I hear Janine speak about the organization, I learn something new because I'm still getting to know it. So it's always interesting to hear the scientific background behind all of this. Um, did I get the spotlight right? Can you all see me and all hear me? Okay, okay, always good to check in. This is lesson number one of programming to seniors is constant check-ins of can everyone hear? Is everyone responding? Everyone engaged? That's the big part. It's very different in many ways and the same in some ways to programming to middle, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and um, active adults. So when I started in May, there were zero programs happening. And we had some things in the pipeline, one of which was a live workshop with Peter Burroughs and Carlos Cesar Rodriguez 
which was the first Arts for the Aging program that I got to see. So Peter jumped in and he is one of our very experienced teaching artists. And he said, I'm gonna do it. And so he put together a live workshop with no input, no training, no technical support, and just made something magical happen. And I got to see that first program and it really informed our direction from that point on. And it really gave us a framework for how we could do it and the fact that we could do it. Because we have a faculty of 25 teaching artists, there's a lot of different personalities we're dealing with. Different levels of comfort with technology, different levels of comfort with um, presenting things when you can't be face to face. So the fact that we could have a workshop, get responses from the caregivers and from the participants and show that we can actually do it, it was amazing. So we started by, first of all, let's get together. So you'll see here a lovely photo from one of our early rehearsals. And this is a group of some of our teaching artists and me looking like I'm throwing gang signs or something, um, trying to explain how we can hear and how we can communicate over the virtual. So I think you've had a lot of um, time in the last two days talking about the technological possibilities of virtual programs. You've learned about um, Discord and how to share screens and how to use all these fabulous breakout rooms and other ways that technology can build community. I'm here to tell you to step back. For seniors, a lot of that is too much. You've got to keep it simple. You've got to get them comfortable with each other and with you. And things like breakout rooms can be so confusing. Suddenly they're with a group of their friends and then boom, there's only two people there. Um, especially when you're dealing with older adults with cognitive and mental issues that they're, they're dealing with. This idea of virtual is very confusing. So take a step back. First, think about what you can do. So in our rehearsals, this is where we first built our community. And in fact, previously, from what I hear from Janine and the teaching artists, they would have several trainings and teaching artist institutes during the year. But because of distance and time constraints, not everyone could always attend. So we actually didn't have a core identity as teaching artists. There were groups that knew each other and collaborated together. But to have everybody being on the screen together all at once created this amazing energy, a creative possibility and a support system that has really helped us as we've developed these virtual programs. And so you'll see here, it's highlighting one of our teaching artists, Wendy, who we actually lost for a while. When I joined, she wasn't on my official list of teaching artists. And thanks to another teaching artist who mentioned, hey, whatever happened with that new teaching artist, Wendy? We reconnected with her and now all of her programs through Arts for the Aging have been virtual. So here she is rehearsing. So it's a first time to even hear her, interact with her or see her. And everyone got together and we gave her feedback of, is your microphone working? Is your spacing correct? Can we hear each instrument? So as musicians, you've probably already figured this out. Those of you who are trying to do virtual, it's hard to hear drums over the internet. It's hard to make sure you balance your voice and music over the internet. So we have practiced and we've tried out and we've done now seven virtual rehearsals. And we've given each teaching artist 20 minutes, sometimes more, sometimes less to experiment. So we don't worry as much about, I'm not, I know they can connect with people on the teaching artist level. So I'm not here to tell them your content needs to change. It's more, can your content be translated properly through this medium? So I really wanna encourage y'all that, you know, look around these little faces in the boxes right now. If you can build your own support community here, this can be your greatest resource for trying new things, for getting feedback on whether something works, getting an audience outside of your, your workshops and your programs that can really help support you and give you good ideas of whether something works or doesn't. Um, I also definitely wanna encourage you when you do have programs scheduled, log on early, 
Like I was here 15 minutes early with Danielle. We were testing sound, testing screen sharing. Is my audio level okay? All those technical stuff, you gotta deal with it early. And that's where the rehearsals help so that you know, where are my settings? What do I need to go fiddle with before I start? So that once the seniors have joined the group, you're ready to go and you are prepared for it all. So as I did also, you know, I did a quick sound check. Can you hear me? You know, we have issues where my internet gets slow and I start cutting out. So being aware of when you see people freeze and compensating for that. So we also were dealing with our participants when we started doing virtual programming had been sitting still for four weeks. They were used to going to senior centers, their adult day centers, having an active social life and an active physical life as well. And suddenly with the shutdown, they were sedentary for so long. There was such a grieving process that it really caused a lot of cognitive and physical decline. And we're still, still dealing with the aftermath of that. You're going to see a lot of this where people are going to be disconnected, even though they're, they might be visible on screen, very common to have them fall asleep on you. No matter how engaging you are, there still will be one screen where they're out, eyes closed, head down. And uh, the fun thing is I've, I've had workshops where I've observed where the other participants call them out on it. You know, like, John, wake up, John, we're in the middle of a program, John, John, over and over. And having that community and that level of trust is very helpful because you as the teaching artist, you know, you might not be comfortable with that level, but still trying to engage them. I also want you to be aware that now that the caregivers are on site, you do have to take into account their participation. So I've had situations <laughs> during movement workshops where the caregiver has actually moved the participants limbs for them. So you're supposed to put your arms all the way over your head, come on, up, up. So making sure that you're communicating not only with the participants, but the caregivers on site as well, engaging them as much as they're comfortable with and making them part of the program is very important because they're, they're observing how things are going and you don't want them to feel, feel like they might be left out. So the, as I mentioned before, the physical and cognitive decline that you're going to see, the most common diagnoses that we deal with are those with Alzheimer's and dementia. So this is a lot of information and I do encourage you to go do your own research and reading, and we can include some links to that as well if you need. But the biggest issue that you will deal with is speech and memory issues. So you may be used to saying, do you remember when? Or do you remember a time when it was cold? Do you remember a Christmas? Do you remember something? You've got to watch your vocabulary. You don't ever want to go directly and ask them a question like that. You want to approach it from another direction of tell me. So thinking of it from tell me about a time that you enjoyed a fall. What is your favorite thing about fall? What smells do you hear in fall? Or smells do you smell in fall? What sounds do you hear? So addressing sensory memory can really draw out those that are, are dealing with dementia and Alzheimer's. Yes, and thank you, Janine. The beautiful questions, the open-ended questions that don't have a definite answer. Janine also mentioned real or imagined memories. I, I observed a workshop where one of our poetry ones, the teaching artist asked, um, does any of y'all play an instrument? And a woman announced, oh yes, I play the trumpet. And I hear in the background, the caregiver going, what? And then the participant turned to the caregiver and said, I totally lied. I know I don't play the trumpet, but nobody was talking. So letting, and the teaching artist worked with it. She, okay, the trumpet, what sounds does the trumpet make? Validating no matter what they say, that you can build on it and work with that connection and not calling them on obvious lies, even when they admit it. Like that is, is part of the process and their participation. They also may have difficulty finding the right word. 
So you need to be careful that they may mean something other than what they say. The aphasia is real with dementia where you may be talking about trains and they reference pumpkins, but they mean trains. So you need to be careful about context and just go with it of repeat what they say, gauge their response and work forward from there. Another issue is mumbling. There will be a lot of low talking of talking to themselves. So in cases like that, I really recommend if they have a, a caregiver on there, trying to repeat what you hear and see if the caregiver responds and repeats what they say where you can understand. But acknowledging them no matter what they say is very important. You don't want to leave someone out of the process just because it may not make sense to you. So any form of, of participation should be valued and recognized. I'm gonna advance here. So we at Arts for the Aging have a teaching artist handbook, which we're currently updating to include all of our virtual um, guidelines and ways of approaching virtual programs. And it actually has a list of 17 guidelines. And I'm going to have Danielle share this with all of y'all at the end, emailing when she sends the materials out for this session. But I wanted to focus on seven in particular. And the very first and most important one is to keep workshop ideas simple. Now, this does not mean simple as in juvenile. This means keeping it to a level where they can grasp the essentials quickly and easily then you can determine how much and how far you can take it. So for visual arts workshops, starting with simple line sketching, can they grasp a pencil? And sometimes it's as simple as that. Are you dealing with people who have the physical abilities to follow through? If they can't, you've got to alter your, your approach. Can they tear paper? Can they create something? So finding activities, no matter your art form, that can be layered upon. So if it's for a movement, they may not be able to have the range of motion to go over their head. So you might have an idea of, we're going to create a whole huge dance together, but their physical motions are limited. So you have to work and build on what they're able to do. I also love this picture. This is one of our teaching artists who does movement, theater, and um, visual arts in her workshops, a nice mix. So she's calling her program right now, the best of. And she's not comfortable using the screen share. In fact, I've created PowerPoints and shared and offered to host as well so I can and support her through it. But for her, she's comfortable presenting everything live and in the moment. And this is a great picture of her holding up a picture of an art book. It did not reduce the experience in any way for the participants to have a very low tech solution to sharing art. And in fact, I love this, you know, the peeking around the corner. And then when people responded to it and then created their own drawings, asking them to hold it up, it was just like in that Monday session where we all made our, our self portraits of what we would rather be doing and then holding up to the screen, low tech, easy, but such a connection that you cre create of, of sharing. And we have another visual artist who's really great and fast, I must say, on, on, with her fingers of spotlighting and highlighting other people because you can't expect the participants to know how to switch to gallery view and switch through views. You cannot give them directions to Zoom. So using your own controls of spotlighting to make sure that people are brought to attention and using those tools you have that are not relying on the participants to control. One thing with keeping it simple is most of our teaching artists ask that everyone be unmuted to start their workshop. This can be difficult and chaotic and cause a lot of noise and confusion, but once you someone they may not have the capacity to go back and unmute themselves. And with Zoom controls as they are right now, you can't unmute them. So be very careful about excluding people, basically. If you mute them, 
they're done. Like their voice cannot be heard through the rest of the program unless there's a caregiver on site who can help them or they're, they've practiced enough, they can do it themselves. So that leads us to the point number two, using participants' names. As a host, you can rename people. I could go in right now and change Janine, Janine's name to anything I wanted. I'm not gonna be rude or mean and do it, but you as host can make sure that everyone who's visible has the right name and making sure that every host for the Zooms, because with us, we deal with client partners who are hosting these Zooms, that they have this information too. A lot of people show up with iPad or their daughter's name or their grandchild's name. And you can't identify them. Like here, I can call out Sherry and Sandra and Curtis and Shona. And I know exactly who's here, but you will be dealing with people who are logged on from who know who's, who knows whose technology and, and iPads and computers. So make sure as people are entering that you rename them if possible. You will also be dealing with people calling over a landline. So it is very important that as people are announced, you catch whose name it is connected to the phone numbers that are calling in and renaming them. They can't see, they can't rename, they can't even mute themselves. So you need to make sure that they are able to participate. You're never gonna remember whose name is associated with a line of numbers. So doing that at the beginning will make it a very, a much more interactive experience for all. Then during your workshop and your programs throughout, making sure that you call people out. Don't wait for people to participate or some just won't. You've got to be proactive in reaching out to them, addressing them. A lot of our music workshops, the teaching artists use names in songs. So, um, good night, Irene. The teaching artist adds in, you know, good night, Kathy, or good night, Curtis, good night, Janet. Every time I've seen that happen, it's like a light bulb goes off, like, oh, he's talking to me. And they get a little closer, and their body language changes, and they get a little more engaged with the process. And it's amazing how just that one simple thing, of using someone's name makes them a part of the experience. Then on to our next, I gotta move my chat, pardon me. This is the part I have trouble with, looking at the camera. Because of Zoom, everyone's in a box all around your screen, but I'm staring off in different directions. I'm not actually looking people in the eye, but as soon as you look in the camera, people feel like you're looking at them. And it makes a big difference for workshops to make sure that you note where your camera is and you check in and you look up at the camera eye to eye. There's only so much you can do face to face over Zoom. And so that one tiny little moment of just looking in the camera creates a connection and a bond between you and the participants. The next is pacing your activities. It is very easy, especially if people end up muting themselves and can't unmute, or if you aren't getting responses to things, to just speed on to the next activity you've created. Like, oh, this clearly isn't working. We need to move on to the next. Let's, maybe they'll connect with that. But sometimes it's not an issue of they aren't connecting. It's that they haven't had time to process. There's a lot happening at once over Zoom. So taking a moment to pause, let it, there be stillness, checking in again of how are you feeling? How did you enjoy that? What do you think about what we just did, about that song or that dance or that video you saw? Giving them space to breathe and be still under process. If you try to rush through this, it will be a bad experience for you and the participants. You'll be frustrated that you didn't get the connection you were hoping for or the product at the end you are hoping for, the end result of goals met. And for the participant, it will be, that was too much, I couldn't handle it. So your goal and should be having fun, having engagement at whatever level and at whatever speed they're ready for. So next, we have focusing on what they can do. 
Like I said, with a lot of the seniors you will see, there will be cognitive and physical impairments that you have to deal with. So we've mentioned Alzheimer's and dementia, but we haven't talked yet about physical limitations. So I, I obliquely mentioned it with not being able to raise your hands over your head, but there's deeper issues you would need to address as well. Hearing impaired can be difficult over Zoom. They can turn their volume up all the way, but if you're speaking too fast or you're not looking at the camera or you're screen sharing so they can't see you in your tiny little box and they can't read your lips, you've gotta be aware of what is, what is happening with your participants. For that, I recommend when you log on for your sound check and your light check and all those tech issues at the beginning, asking the host, what do I need to know about these participants? What can you tell me that will make this a successful workshop? And you may get a wide range. You never know what you'll hear of. Oh, you know, Gregory's blind and he's sitting there in the dark in his room. So you won't be able to see him, but he can hear you. Let's make sure that you have a lot of verbal descriptions of what you're doing. Or so-and-so is here with her grandkids. So she's gonna be on mute and there's gonna be people running in and out. Having a heads up on different issues and expectations at the beginning will help you plan ahead for anything and any adjustments you need to make as you go along. The, the verbal and the other issues we talked about with Alzheimer's and dementia, but then I want you to focus also on any response that they give physically for movement, respond to and call out. It's always best to have your screen on gallery view. Being able to see everybody who's participating is the best way to make sure you're checking in with everyone. So we have a lot of teaching artists who do movement who like to create collaborative choreography and being able to watch throughout, then you can call it out of, when you ask for somebody to offer a movement and there's nothing, stillness, silence, but you've seen somebody do something at some point of, oh, I saw Janet do a little wiggle when I was playing the music. Let's all wiggle like Janet. And building on something you've observed and to, so it pulls them out ahead of time. And that leads to this idea of silence. Just like with the stillness, don't be afraid to wait. Like, Sandra, can you give me a movement with your hands? And she gave it and then you respond, thank you, Sandra. Let's all wave like Sandra. Here we go. And see, sometimes like Curtis is off video, you'll have people off video and off mic, but you wanna make sure they're engaged at some point. Curtis, if you're able to unmute, can you tell us what you're doing with your hands? And Curtis appears and gives us a hand movement. So you see a pause and a wait and give people time to respond. You don't know why they've turned off their video or their mic. It might take calling out people twice and then moving on eventually. Best story I have about the silence is that it was at Lewinsville, which is in, there in Fairfax County. One of our movement artists, we've been dealing with people calling in over telephone. So they had, um, or, or they just turned off their video and were muted the whole time. We don't know if they're responding. And normally our teaching artists were just ignoring it because they were focused on the eight people who were on video. like. And that was enough to have a great workshop, but we were missing the six who were off. One of our teaching artists just took the opportunity to call on someone who had no video and was muted and waited. She called three times and I was getting frustrated. I was like, okay, time to move on. Like clearly it's not happening. Let's, let's keep the workshop going. But I kept quiet because that's not my job. And they unmuted and they responded and they described their movement and then they stayed unmuted and then offered input throughout the rest of the workshop, not being called on. And I know I could hear it in the voice. At first it was very tentative and shy of, are you sure you want me to be involved? And by the end, it was very strong and assertive and just being very involved in the whole process. And that only took five seconds of silence. And so it was amazing how just that moment then created that connection and participation. 
And so finally, this is a core tenant of Arts for the Aging. It's one of our main values. Be ready to improvise. Improvisation is key to the arts, is improving on what is, reacting to what happens and making it better. You never know what's gonna happen in a workshop. You may have the same participants, the same activities, the same approach on, the sa on different days and you'll have an entirely new experience in creation. So being able to work with what's happening in that moment. We had a poetry workshop that Janine actually got to observe as well. And it was a poetry and music collaboration. And one of the participants was asked, you know, what do you have to be grateful for today? And he said, nothing. She validated that. Okay, John has nothing to be grateful for today. Let's all be grateful for nothing. And people responded well to it. Then we made a collaborative poem together of what are you thankful for? And again, John was thankful for nothing. And it went into the poem. And you could see he was proud of the fact that his contribution, even though he was trying to be as curmudgeonly as possible, he was not engaged. There was a smirk when he heard his line read, when we read the whole collaborative poem. He was involved, he was invested in it. His nothing mattered. And even though he didn't want to participate, he still did. And his response was valid and, and included and part of the community that we built. So I'm really proud of how each of our teaching artists has really found a different way of approaching and dealing with the virtual. And what I'm extra, extra proud of is the new collaborations that have been built. So just because people might not be able to connect with poetry one-on-one -on -one in this experience, we've started the poetry and music collaborations. So having a break in the middle when there's been lots of talking and reading and deep discussions on what different lines of the poem means, then to sit back and listen to a little bass music playing what a wonderful world. Taking that moment of silence and stillness to process what's happened and then to move back into creativity. So don't be afraid to include other art forms with what you're doing. Think of it as a little break, a refresher in between. Instead of, excuse me, trying to push through and accomplish as much as possible, find something else that they might connect with. Because after that break of listening to A Wonderful World, we then talked about the lyrics. And that segued us right back into poetry again. So I want to show you this, because this is a screenshot from early on in our um, programs. And if you're willing to unmute, let's deal with this like you would visual art. Tell me, what do you see in the screenshot of a workshop? And just holler it out. No need to raise hands. There's few enough here. A lot of love, yes, the hearts over the faces. We had to protect privacy, but yes, a lot of love. Different locations. Mm-hmm, that very good eye. You're reaching them in their homes. This is very personal of how we're approaching virtual programs. They're not in an adult day center. They're not in a sterile environment. They're surrounded by the things and the people they love. And we need to respect that the fact that they're inviting us into their homes. We are guests in their homes and treating them as friends and family. What else do you see? Togetherness. Mm -hmm. And what makes you feel they're together in this? Um, they're all participating doing essentially the same thing. Although they are separate, they are collective they're together. Yes, that same movement, they're following together. But beyond together, what else do you notice? Are they all together? There's differences in the together, right? <laughs> um, and <laughs> some reach all the way, some don't quite um, have their fingers being able to touch. But it's essentially the same movement, but individualized differences in, in between. Yes, because we are respecting what they can do. It's not expecting 
this to be a perfect chorus line, of everyone exactly the same, respecting the differences and the, the abilities. What else do y'all notice? They're separate but equal because the, uh, the color of the hearts um, makes them equal. Mm -hmm. Kind of creates a level playing field. Who's the instructor? Can you tell? Where's our teaching artist? Top left? No. Mm -hmm. I love this because it, it shows how far we've come in some ways too. Nancy, who is highlighted in the yellow, is our teaching artist. After this, I worked with Nancy on camera angles. Mm -hmm. You can't see the top of Nancy's head. And it was okay. <laughs> it was. People had no problems following along even though they couldn't see her arms. Nancy had a lot of issues with she really wants to be close and she's really great at that. She gets in and talks directly to the camera when she's discussing what they're going to do and the goals of the program. And then she moves back and gives you the full body experience of how you can follow along and move. The problem is she changes her angle when she gets close and then forgets to adjust it when she moves back. So she's got it now. This is from months ago with an early workshop. And do you notice, can you see where Nancy is looking? Look at angled. Mm -hmm. She's angled off screen. Nancy set up a separate monitor on the side because she felt disconnected with the camera, the laptop so far away. So she set up a separate monitor so she could see gallery view right next to her because she wants to respond to people's movements and have them close to her, even though she's trying to get her whole body in the camera angle. So I keep reminding her, Nancy, you got to look at the camera. The camera's in front of you, not to the side of you, but she needs that check-in to have see what the participants are doing. So that can be helpful where you're using the tech to support your efforts. You're not relying on, on them just to follow you. Um, I also wanted to show, do you see the people who aren't participating? Like not everybody's moving, not everyone is engaged and that's gonna happen and it's okay. Now, um, the very center heart, um, I can tell you his name is Frank. Uh, he is very verbal and hard to hear. So he's got a very, something has damaged his vocal cords, but he loves to share and tell his stories. And thankfully he often has a caregiver on site. So he has directed movement verbally and his caregiver has been interpreted. And then Nancy has taken those movements and done them for him. So finding ways where somebody has limited physical abilities, but you can still involve them in the activity and the process. Tell me what to do, Frank. Let me show you, let me show your movements to others. So finding those moments. Um, can you tell who's our host? So every client partner has somebody who's hosting the activity. Person that's outside. You got it. Yes, good call. What made you say that though? I don't know. I think it's what I would choose to do. <laughs> Be outside if you can. Yeah. Uh, we encourage all of our, our client partner hosts to enjoy and participate. And we find that it's a much better experience for the participants than if like me, I went off the screen for a while. But if everyone, is part of the process. Don't be just a, a sitting head right there typing away on your computer while everyone else is participating. You know, call them out too. Say, join us. Let's see, what movement do you have? Or what visual art do you wanna share? What description do you need? Or can you sing along with us? Make sure they're included in this community building. All right, well, we have been here for over an hour now. So I think we're going to segue to a short five minute break. And we've done a lot of pre-recorded programs that we have shared with people who haven't been able to come to our live workshops. So one of our, our very first actually pre-recorded program was a Rhythms of Life workshop that includes some seated stretching, light yoga with improvisational bass. 
So you're gonna have five minutes of this playing. Feel free to stay if you want, feel free to turn off your camera, go wander off, take a break. Once the video is done, we will continue and I will introduce our teaching artists for the workshop portion of the presentation. Sides, breathing in and hold it here, breathe out. Good, relax to center, breathe in. one arm. Reach it up to the sky as we breathe in. Two, three, four, and breathe out. Bring that arm down. Two, three, four. Let's switch arms. Breathing in. And breathe out. Bring that arm down. All right, let's do that again. Back to the other arm. Breathing in. Reaching up through the fingertips and breathe out. Fantastic. Switch arms. Breathing in all the way to the sky. And breathe out. This time we're going to go up with both arms. Both arms in the air. Breathing in. Two, three, four. And down. Let's do that again. Breathe in. shoulders up to our ears, breathing in, and down, relax, breathing out, let's do that again, both shoulders up, breathing in, kind of roll them forward, and breathe out, bring him down, but rolling forward, great, let's switch directions, breathing in, but rolling our shoulders back, and breathe out, keep rolling. Great. Let's start one shoulder at a time, breathing in and up and up and up and breathing out and putting our shoulder down. Switch sides and up. Three, four, and down. Two, three, four. Switch back. Two, three, four. And down, two, three, four, other shoulder, and up, two, three, four, and down. Great, follow me now. We're going to take two counts for each shoulder, right? Here we go, and up, two, and down, two, and switch, two, and down, two, one more time, and up. Down and switch up and down. Great. How about one beat? Up, down, switch up, down, switch up, down. Great. We're going to double time it. Get your body dancing. All right. So we got up, down, and back, forth, back. Get your arms into it a little bit. Up. And I know you're in a chair, but you can get your upper body into it. Nice. Keep moving it back and forth. Feel that whole body. Nice. Really lovely job. Take your arms, shake them out for me. Turn some doorknobs. Breathe out. Some gimme gimmies. 
great. Take him away, I don't want it. Breathe in. And breathe out. Shake out your whole body. Great. Arms still. Breathe in. And four. Breathe out. Three. Four. One more time. Breathe in. time with us and uh yeah keep moving your body to the rhythm stay safe stay sane stay healthy and welcome back find your way back from the kitchen or the restroom or outside walking the dog whatever you needed to do during the five minutes. Go holler at your kids to do their homework. Thanks to Sandra who stayed and stretched a little with me. When that video first came out, I probably had it on repeat and watched it maybe five, six times in a row while I was working. Just that bass, the jazzy and the sound of Manny's voice just relaxing you, little zen, little moment of it's going to be okay. <laughs> so we actually did a Rhythms of Life 2 as well, pre-recorded program, where they encouraged people to find items in their house to make rhythms on. So like rubbing a spoon across a binder edge and clapping a book together and all kinds of things to get people moving, motivated, and involved in the process. And we've actually started adding closed captioning to all of our videos now too. In, in fact, our latest had descriptive closed captioning that described the music that was playing throughout and gave it very poetic words to capture the idea of tango music and the connection between the music and the presentation. Because um, we really want to make sure our programs are accessible to all. And that means not leaving them out of the music just because they're deaf or hard of hearing Music is still a way to appreciate the arts. All right, I'm hoping people are coming back because now we get to the exciting fun portion, which is you are going to be participants in an Arts for the Aging workshop. So if you're able to come back on video, wonderful, no pressure because Peter is quite experienced at, at providing workshops for those who are off camera and still being engaging. So I do want to introduce Peter Joshua Burroughs and Carla Cesar Rodriguez, who we are very glad to be have as part of our teaching artist facility. As I mentioned before, they were the pilot workshops for us. In fact, when we have our reconnections with partners that we had programmed in person with, and now we're trying to get virtual programming off, off the ground, Peter's and Carla's workshop is the first one I schedule because I know I can depend on the quality of it. I know that it will be engaging. I know that people will ask for more after they have been at one of his cooperation workshops. So I will drop their resumes into the chat later, but just know that we have, we are very blessed to have their talent involved because they are incredibly experienced both as teaching artists, beyond arts for the aging, and as performers and actors, pianists, and I am so pleased to introduce Peter, Carlos, and cooperation. Oh, you're muted, Peter. Huh, interesting. Okay, I'm not muted anymore, right? No, you're good. All right, that's the first step is just admit to being part of the process and we're all in the boat together. So let's have a good time today. My name is Peter and my partner back there is Carlos, Carlos Cesar Rodriguez. And uh, we're excited to be presenting this little program from Arts for the Aging today. And we'd like for all of you to get involved. The name of the program is actually Cooperation. And you'll find out very quickly that I'm very childlike in the way that I look at things. And I invite all of you to be childlike right along with me. How do you feel about being childlike, Curtis? You okay with that? All right, he says, okay. How about Sandra, you okay with being childlike? 
Yeah, so if you want to unmute, you're welcome to. You'll see sometimes because I'm working on my phone that my finger kind of swipes across and now I can see Janet and I'm saying, hey, Janet, how are you doing today? It's so good to see you. So I'm an opera singer. How many of us know anything about opera already? How about you, Danielle? You know anything about opera? <laughs> I thought I heard someone unmute. I'd love to listen. I was an opera singer when I was young. Oh my goodness, I'm really in trouble then, huh? So, do you have a favorite opera? Oh, all operas are wonderful. Mozart's my favorite composer. Mozart is your favorite. Okay, we'll try to get some Mozart in today then. So regularly in the program, we're gonna do a bunch of musical excerpts, but let's start with something that's really easy. Let's figure out a way that we can all cooperate <laughs> right away. By the way, why do you think I call my program Cooperation? Co we all do operation. <laughs> it's easier with a graphic. But if you take the CO off of cooperation, it means together. We've got just operation, which is making something happen. And then if you take off the shun, which is the most complicated of that part of that word in English, that's the most complicated part because it means different things when it's applied to different words. But in this case, it's the act of doing something. When we take off the co and the shun, we're left with O-P-E-R-A, O-P-E-R-A, opera. So I like to say we can't have cooperation without opera right in the middle of it. Now, opera can sometimes be a little offsetting. So let's just enter gently. Can you all say with me, la, la, la? La, la, la. la, la, la. There we go. La, 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 again. La, 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 la. la. <laughs> and then we're going to make it a little bit more exciting. La, 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 la. All right. So all music is based on sequences. So our sequence is going to be la, 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 la. You'll notice I like to use my hands and my whole body to express things. So don't just use your voices. Let's use our hands and our bodies, too. All right, and I'm switching back and forth to make sure I've got everyone's attention here. I love your input. It really inspires me. So let's try this again. La, la, la. La, la, la. La, la, la. La, la, la. La, 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 we can also use them in any language that we want to sing in, right? right? Now we can also add a melody to those things. How about if we went la la la, la la la, la 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 Can you do that with me? <laughs> la la la, la la la, la 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 now, you might have noticed that we're not all together because we're all in different places. But I think if we just let that go and sing with gusto, we're going to be just fine. By the way, thank you for letting us come into your home. It's really cool to be in your homes with you today. And I think it's especially fun to share with you while you're in your own spaces. Now, usually before I do this program, I might send a little message saying, if you'd like to bring a scarf along with you, if you'd like to bring a pillow, if you'd like to bring a paintbrush, please bring these things and we'll incorporate them into what we can do. I've got a paintbrush over here. See my paintbrush? It's a trim brush, right? You could have an artist brush. You could have any kind of a brush. What do we usually do with a paintbrush? <laughs> I told you I was childlike. I'm not <laughs> disappointing, right? How about Kristen Roman? Do you know what to do with a paintbrush? All right, Kristen, I'll come back to you later then. How about, let's see, who else can we find? Here. How about Janine, what should I do with this paintbrush? Oh, Kristen did chime in. Oh, Kristen, what did you say, Kristen? Um, I said you could tap it on your hand like a drum. I could. We could all try it if you want. If you don't have a paintbrush, you can just use your hand on your other hand, right? Let's do what we were just singing. La la la, la la la, la 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 la
Oh my goodness, you guys are fantastic. I have to take you on the road with me. So what we're doing is we're learning a little segment from an opera, which is sung by the chorus. And you guys are the most, most important group in an opera, right? The opera chorus. And we're gonna sing this two times through and we're gonna add it into a little scene. Now opera is a journey of imagination. So we use our imaginations to fly away to distant lands. This opera is gonna take us to the castle of the Duke of Mantua. So the other thing that I like to do in opera is I like to give myself something to wear. And I'd love to invite all of you to wear something that makes you feel like you are the Duke of Mantua <laughs> or <laughs> laughter is really good or perhaps something that would make you feel like you're at a party. You know, I didn't give you enough warning so you might not have your props with you, but look around you. Do you have anything in your room that can help? All right, so you got a scroll, Peter. Huh? Go scroll to see Sherry. Go scroll to see Sherry. All right, there we go. All right, so I've got a crown also. You might notice that my crown is not really a crown, it's something that I turned into a crown, right? And that's all part of imagination. I like the fact that you guys are jumping in and being childlike with me. Oh my goodness, look at that, Sherry. I was looking at a different person. I love this. That's fantastic. All right. <laughs> hey, that's a great, that's, that's more like the paintbrush, right? Can you hold that up again, Sherry? Why don't you take your star balloon wand and why don't you help me draw a triangle in the air? One, two, three. One, two, three. If you don't have a paintbrush or a star balloon wand, you can use your hands for this. One, two, three, one, two, three. If we get it going good enough, we can get Carlos to play the piano. Here we go. One, two, three, one, two. All right. Very good. Thanks, Sherry, for the help. How's everyone else doing? Are we okay? All right, I see Shona has a lovely crown and she's got, what is that you've got there? A triangular ru a ruler, Oh, perfect. my kid's ruler. Perfect, so you're using your triangular ruler to draw the triangle in the air. I like to think of this as painting the music in the air and music can have different shapes and different sizes. But the most important thing I think about opera is it's a way to communicate with each other and it's a way to celebrate our lives, right? So our la 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 is gonna be celebratory. Let's all sing together. La la la, 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 la la la. All right, molto bene, molto bene. Oh my goodness, there I go again. I'm speaking a different language. Starts with that opera thing, right? Opera is really opera. And opera is a work of art. In fact, operare, the verb that opera comes from, means to work. All right. Now, let's put this into a little bit of a scene. Imagine, that's the imagination coming back, that you're at the castle of the Duke of Mantua. And um, I need help from all of you, maybe, um, Shona, could you be the conductor for me? Yes. The conductor is the person in opera that keeps us all together. So Shona, even though we're distanced and you're in your house and I'm in mine, why don't you make your triangle in the air and I'll try to come in with where you are. La la la, la la la. All right, so each one of us, each one of us can conduct the others when we're in this space. It's really pretty fun. So the Duke of Mantua is kind of showing off for his friends and he's saying, la donna è mobile. Does anyone speak Italian here? Nem. All right, so if no one speaks Italian, I could get away with not translating it, but I want to get myself in trouble for a minute. 
and then I want to get myself out of trouble. So I'm going to translate it directly. La donna è mobile. Women change their minds all the time. Now I've lost half the room already, right? <laughs> it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> but says, women change their minds all the time. Uh, la donna è mobile. Qual più mal vento? Like a feather in the wind. How does a feather fall in the wind? Anyone know? Oh, I see. Sherry is showing me that it falls in kind of indiscriminate directions. Uh-oh, that doesn't sound very complimentary either. So, la donna mobile, qual più mal vento, muta da cento, without any warning, è di pensier. So, you can tell right away this was written a long time ago, right? Because I don't think, let's see, are there any men in the room? I know we have at least one. Curtis, Curtis, have you ever changed your mind? As often as possible. As often as possible. <laughs> so, so it's definitely not all women change their minds frequently, right? All of us change our minds, right? Exactly. All right. So, <laughs> so let's all change our minds together. I propose, though, since it was written a long time ago, and the words can be a little bit, you know, discriminatory, let's change one word. Instead of la donna e mobile, let's change it to la vita e mobile. Do you know what I mean by la vita? Life. 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 I heard several people saying life. And la life fire. changes all the time, sometimes like a feather in the wind, sometimes without any warning, and frequently without caring about what we're talking about, right? But life is still worth celebrating. So let's celebrate life today. Why don't you get your paintbrushes or your hands out? Let's start painting that music in the air. Let's get Carlos to sing along with uh, play along and why don't you all point at me and tell me when I should sing all right so we'll start with Carlos one all right if you point at me I can sing right la vita è mobile, quale più mai avvento, muta l'accento, è di pensiero, sempre un amabile, leggio il provito, di bianco in riso, e non è suoniero, la vita è mobile, quale più mai avvento, muta l'accento. Oh my goodness. Wow. I said it before that I wanted to take you on tour. I'd also like you to get a nice cocktail and have a drink with me. I've got a mixture of water and juice here. It's very important that we stay hydrated during our daily routines, right? So go ahead and take a drink. I'm going to drink the whole glass. Hope that doesn't offend anyone. I'm drinking coffee. Maestro is drinking his coffee, his favorite morning and afternoon cocktail. Oh, feeling pretty good. I got you into singing right away, right? How's your, how are your bodies feeling? Feel like you're breathing okay? Let's take a deep breath in. Open up those chests. Breathe out. We can, we can, yeah, I love this. Uh, Janet is lifting her arms up as she breathes in. Let's all breathe in with her. And let's let that come down. I noticed that Janet's arms went out and then up. I noticed that Janine's arms went more forward. I noticed that uh, Danielle's arms are going up like a dancer. So it doesn't matter. We can do whatever we need to do with our arms so that it's comfortable. I think the most important thing is that we feel like we can move, that our movements are relaxing and they're letting joy escape from our bodies, right? All right, so I love to tell a lot of different stories in opera. 
but it's a little challenging, I think, sometimes when it's all in a different language, right? How many people here speak a different language besides English, which I'm speaking in now? Carlos, Carlos speaks Spanish. All right, Shaya, whoa, drop my, drop my baton. Uh-huh, we got a lot of language. Marsha, put up. her hand up. Uh-huh, I see Shona. You guys can all unmute and just call out. You're very polite. It's okay. Well, I've sung in 17 languages, but I only can speak English. <laughs> oh my goodness, I need to find who's speaking to me. Cassandra again. Sandra, you've sung in 17 languages? That's pretty impressive. I'm not sure I can count 17 for myself, but in opera, we frequently sing in different languages. The next opera I wanted to look at is Mozart. I think you said you like Mozart, right? And this is another, it's a prince, not a king or a duke. And the prince, Tamino, is just entering the stage and he is being confronted by a horrible, scary serpent. <laughs> All right. Now, usually I'd like to have all of you play the serpent. All right. So I, if we were all together, I could pass out this scarf and one person could hold it and another person could hold it. But we can do the same thing if you've got something like a scarf, if you got something like your jacket, anything, hold it up in front of your camera and see if we can make that serpent move. Oh, there we go. We've got an afghan. We've got a fan. We've got a face mask. Or is it a hair tie? Ah, oh, fantastic. All right, now let's see if we can get that movement. We'll make Carlos's piano start. All right. Uh -huh. All right, very good. All right, very good. I love this movement. You guys are incredibly creative. You're all artists, choreographers, and singers. That's great. I don't have to do much. So let's think about this. If we've got the serpent moving, we got to get rid of that snake so that I can lose my sense of fear, right? Because the first words I'm going to say is, oh, help me, protect me, for else I shall perish. The treacherous serpent will soon overtake me. Oh, heaven, have mercy. The serpent draws near. The serpent draws near. Oh, rescue me. Oh, save me, save me, save me, save me, save me. Rescue me. And then I need you to rescue me, right? So we've got that serpent, right? The serpent is moving. We're going to take our hands. And we're going to use our imagination to take a ball of, let's say, hot taffy. And we're going to take that hot taffy. We're going to roll it up in our hands and we're going to throw it at the serpent. <laughs> All right. So we take the taffy, we roll it up and we throw it at the serpent. I told you I was childlike, right? <laughs> All right. Now, as we do that, why don't we say something too? Now, vicious snake, you'll disappear. All right, just so we're not distracted, let's say it without moving. Now, now vicious snake, snake, snake you'll, disappear. you'll disappear. Now, the thing is, we're singing opera, right? So we don't get off the hook. We can't just speak it. We're going to sing it. And so it starts up about here. Now, vicious snake, you'll disappear. Oh my goodness, that is a gorgeous voice. I want to sing a duet with you <laughs> next time. All right, so if we say, now vicious snake will disappear, and we throw the ball of taffy, that scarf can just fall to the ground. So we're having instant staging. We're virtually pulling ourselves together into community, we're sharing in musical experience, and we're telling the story of the prince who's confronted by his fears and then is saved by his colleagues. Now in the opera, the colleagues are magical creatures. Do we have magical creatures in the room today? Let's see. Oh, I think there's a magical creature right there. Kirsten's room. 
Oh, there we have a magical creature. Sherry, wow, I need you to come. You have the best props. <laughs> All right. So those have magical a creatures troll. are the ones that will take that ball of fire. Or sorry, that ball of taffy. I decided not to be so violent with fire. The ball of taffy, and they'll throw it. And then some of us can stay as the serpent. All right, so we got the musical introduction, which Carlos is going to play, and you'll hear a heartbeat. You hear that the music describes how we're feeling. So we have to use our faces to show it too. Do I look afraid? Do I look afraid now? How's this? All right, let's get that serpent moving. All right. Can you help me? How about you, Sarah? Can you help me? For the serpents, throughout this giant is coming after me. participation. You guys are getting me moving. You're getting me excited. You're bringing me back into the world. It's really a great gift to be here with all of you today. So how's everyone else feeling? I Peter, see some people are looking Peter, down. Peter, there's a hand raised. Marsha has her hand raised. Okay. It might have been left over from when who could speak another language. I don't okay. think Marsha got a chance to say. All right, so here I've got my gallery view set up now. I'm sorry, I'm new to this technology. So Marsha, you still want to tell us something? Uh, she says in the chat Yes, room. that is old. <laughs> well, you know what? That's an interesting thing that you say. You know, our company is called Arts for the Aging, right? But I think that we can all agree that really it's arts by the aging because all of us are aging every day, right? And I love to celebrate the process of aging and I like to use the arts to keep us in community with each other. All right, so I was asked to give about 20 minutes today. I think we've got about 20 minutes so far. Mm -hmm. Would you like to see anything else or should I turn this back over to Sarah? How about if we turn it over to our participants? Uh, I just added, I added I'd to like the to chat those, oh, sorry. See, Zoom, you're talking over each other again. Yeah, it's my fault. Um, I just did think this is an important thing I think to show is that usually when we're ending our program, we switch to something that's a little more accessible. We do um, some Gershwin and I take the camera and I start singing to the camera and then I move and I focus it on Carlos and I bring it closer so that he could, we can appreciate his artistry too. We can see his hands. It's something we don't often think about being able to do. But we can always do this. And then I can switch back. And I can get real close. It's very clear. Our love is here to stay. Gracias. 
Bravo. Hey. Bravo. Bravissimo. Oh, Good and night, Peter, go, go show your lovely headless dance partner, too. Oh, OK. So uh, another program that Carlos and I do with another teaching artist, Alex, is about tango. And it started as an in-person workshop, but some of the seniors didn't necessarily want to dance with other people. So we developed the idea of turning pillows into dance partners. And part of that program, we actually just take a pillow and put clothes on it during the program. This one's maybe a little bit fancy, but anything works. Donna, get a skeleton. What was huh? that? Donna has a skeleton that does all kinds of things. Awesome. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm setting up my skeletons and spider webs for a, a memory cafe that we're doing on the 30th, so. <laughs> All right, so I'm sorry. Let me pass this on and let's continue with the workshop. Since we've got about 10 minutes left, I let's jump to the Q&A and how we can help support you, give you advice, give you context for how we've handled different issues you might be dealing with now. We've got Peter and Carlos as a great resource, especially about sound and any other, let's, we don't need to focus on tech, but let's talk about you know, content and reaching the audience. Shauna. Um, so I'm a mosaic artist and I also teach um, young children. Um, with, the, with the online aspect, I think, um, uh, you know, looking back to when I bring materials into a workshop, the joy is, from looking through the various materials and picking and choosing what one would like to work with. Um, how do you do that in an online environment? Like I'd love to teach small mosaics or something like that, um, but I don't know how to, how to send materials out into the world for people to choose from and how would that be um, accomplished? That is a difficulty we have also had to address. Mm -hmm. For us personally as at Arts for the Aging, we've developed something we call heart kits and we've packaged materials, art making materials along with instructions that are needed and delivered them with meals to seniors. We're trying to do follow-up programs so that a teaching artist can walk them through verbally with what's in the kit so they can call from a landline. And I can see an issue though, if you don't have a delivery method because we're working with client partners who have a connection and have those deliveries already set up. Right. That's one way. Um, a possibility that we've talked with other partners is having an Amazon wish list. Mm -hmm. Maybe you just to create a list of the types of materials that they need and if they're capable of purchasing on their own to be shipped to their own home, you've got those suggestions, but easy links to click. I think simpler, the better is what you need to think of. Got it. I have a question about about Zoom. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we have to go to the the fee for the year for Zoom in order to facilitate this, correct? And is there any other platform besides Zoom that we can use? Mm -hmm. um, if you are the one that's expected to host the program or workshop, definitely get a paid account because the free account will kick you off after forty minutes. It also has limited capabilities for other things that you want to do, like recording, um, as we've discovered. A lot of our teaching artists don't have a paid account, but they're able to handle that because our client partners are the ones hosting, and all they have to do is attend, because you don't have to have a paid account to attend other people's hosted workshops or Zoom meetings. And then so, I have a paid account, so I can host is how we handle it. And... Um... I'm working mostly with children at this point. So in order to videotape and record, mm -hmm. we need permission, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Written, permission. Written permission. You can also, what a lot we do is we also verbalize it at the beginning. We are going to record. If you don't want your image or participation to be recorded, please turn off your video. And so that limits your level of interaction, but it preserves their privacy. So being upfront about recording and what you will use that for as well is important. But I definitely encourage written permission, not just a verbal permission. And if you're dealing with children, you've got to get you know, parents permission. Can I jump into, um, we are doing primarily Zoom workshops, but some of our client centers do use GoToMeeting as well. 
I've also done with other organizations, programs with Facebook Live, with Facebook Meetings, with Facebook Messenger. And I think there's a Google Meetup app that people are using as well. I think that if you have client partners or specific people that are interested in your work, ask them what, com what, you know, what platforms they're most comfortable with. Um, I do a lot of my specific vocal teaching, just voice lessons on FaceTime. Um, so anyway, I hope that was helpful. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you. And there was a question in here from Marsha, uh, specifically to Peter, I think was important. I love your use of the phone and moving it places. My experience with virtual teaching has been that you need an ethernet connection to be able to get the kind of seamless connection that I saw with your phone. How do you, did you overcome that need? Well, interestingly enough, my phone was plugged into an ethernet connection, um, but when I moved it, I took the ethernet connection out. And I, I have to admit, this is the first time I've ever used the ethernet connection, um, but um, you can get, uh, I ordered it on Amazon and it's adapter that takes ethernet in one end and plugs into your iPhone, oh, that's the camera, your iPhone on the other end. And then I've got a 50 foot ethernet cable that I can stretch across my living room that plugs directly into the router. But I must say that even before I had the ethernet, because the phone will toggle back and forth between internet and telephone line, that it seems to provide a more consistent connection that many computers do. And we did it at the, end. The, the other issue that I will share is that no matter how perfect we make our end of it, it depends on what the other people's computers and devices they're watching it are on. It's going to affect the quality. Um, so, and, and also we strategize how to move it. Like, yeah. So, and we we had, and I was actually very clumsy in the way that I just moved my phone. Usually, I've practiced that move, and I know which direction my phone is in the cradle, so that when I pick it up, you don't see my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we, we, you know, it takes, you know, as, as Sarah told you before, having the rehearsals with other artists that are watching you and giving you advice on how to do things, you know, that's something that I can practice in a group like we're in today. And you can give me feedback and tell me what your experience is like. Um, but I think the overall, the most important thing is work with the technology that you feel comfortable using. Keep learning and add things in as you go. Um, but there's, there's quite a bit that you can do just, just with the phone. And as Sarah wisely said, and this is probably my biggest struggle, especially with online programming is keeping things as simple as possible. Cause I have grand desires to, you know, make beautiful music with everyone. Um, but I think the, the focus is the interaction, the letting people know you're with them, noticing that people are responding, encouraging each other and really bringing as best we can into a community. And, and here I go with my, this, you know, even before we started virtual programming, working with Arts for the Aging, you feel like you're bringing something to a center or to a community, but you always walk away with so much more than you have brought to them. Um, so I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> and Curtis had a question, which I think might actually be a qu more for Danielle than us, but it was, is it best to contact each facility individually or is there a central way to contact groups of facilities? And because Arts for the Aging is working with client partners, we have established relationships. And so I deal with the scheduling and getting things set. And then I pick the teaching artists and schedule them. But I know that Danielle has a different method for Arts Fairfax. Yeah, and actually I, um, I mentioned before that we're working to host some residencies in Fairfax County Senior Centers um, and that that's something that we could connect with um, offline. I don't know if Kristen, if you have any um, tips for how to kind of contact you guys about um, getting in touch with facilities. Well, um, so the, so our, the virtual center for active adults are two accounts that covers the 14 senior centers in Fairfax County. So if you're familiar with the 14 centers, that's who we're umbrellaed under and all of those participants and staff are all coming to the virtual center for active adults. Um, so I would say for that there are the senior centers. Um, and then I know you mentioned, and I know Arts for Aging has a partnership with um, 
the adult day health cares. There's four adult day health cares and they are running their own virtual program specific to memory care. Um, and there is some cross collaboration and we work with them. We share our calendars and some of the activities or their participants come to ours and we send some participants to theirs, but they're, they have staff doing their own activities. So I would be a contact. We have a programming team that we, that we work with of when we start adding new people onto our calendar. So I would be a good contact to get into that rotation um, and, and to get on the calendar. I will say we have a um, creative corner every Friday at 2.30 that we're always looking to, that we rotate different activities into that. So we're always looking, oh, that's a great opportunity to introduce um, an artist or an activity. Um, and then as well as right now we're exploring um, evening activities. Um, and so we're going to launch a poll for our participants next week um, using Zoom uh, polling options to ask them, um, are they interested in evening activities? What days of the week and what times and what type of activities? Do they want more exercise? Do they want concerts? Um, and so we'll be getting that information next week and then start developing and reaching out to partners to kind of fill, fulfill that, th those. So, but yes, we have two paid accounts um, and are able to host and be the host and bring people onto our, our platform. And that's so helpful because then you don't have to worry about that side and setting it up and communicating and such. You get to show up and do what you do best. Up until the pande pandemic stroke uh, struck, uh, I was working for an org organization called Taffy uh, theater arts uh, festival for youth. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that. Um, and they were paying me to go into schools with children, who are underserved um, teenagers and youth. They've you know gone to Fairfax Hall. They use mostly mu musicians. I'll put the link on the chat. You know, I'll put their web address. You might want to check that out. I don't know what they're doing currently because I haven't been in touch. You know, in the last eight months, but they were doing some good things. I also wanted to lift up something that Shauna put in the in the chat, which was that, you know, we're acknowledging that a lot of our client partners just aren't in a place yet where they can accept new modalities for programming. They're really just trying to still either reinvent themselves and deliver their core safety net services. So I just I just wanted to acknowledge that that's that's real. Um, and we have, um, you know, without without pestering. Um, you know, we, we certainly are still following up with a lot of our clients that, you know, haven't been responsive. We're not giving up on them. We want them to know we haven't forgotten about them. So, um, you know, we're kind of taking a patient persistence approach. Mm -hmm. And this is why we're working hard to translate our programs to those who don't have video. People who can call in from a landline to, to Zoom, which is a handy way to reach them but we've got to use much more verbal descriptions in all of our programming and being careful what we try to do over it. You can't translate everything over the phone. All right. So further questions, ways we can help. I dropped into the chat the links that Janine referenced in her introduction about how, what the therapeutic benefits of the arts and all those studies that she referenced and the um, arts for the aging social impact of the arts, their, their wheel, which is amazing. You should go check it out. Giant color wheel full of information. Just made my data and arts ha hurt happy. Um, and then a link to Peter Burroughs and our TA, our teaching artist bios on our website. But I hope you feel free to use us as a resource as well. Um, Daniel will be sharing our contact information. I'm happy to follow up with any of y'all with and with our guidelines and give you any more advice and support as you need it moving forward. And I'm happy, you know, if, if you ask Sarah, she can put you in touch with me if you have specific questions. Um, you know, it's just the interesting thing is just see what you have around you in your house, see what you can use, maybe go to a drugstore and buy a couple of these clip lamps because you can greatly increase your your lighting. Yeah, I've got six of these that I hang on my you know, the woodwork in my house, plus I've got some other lighting. But um, the one thing I really learned is that lighting from the front is so much better than lighting from the back. 
Um, but it's really, it's a, it's a, it's been a really interesting creative process as an artist to figure out how to, you know, pick yourself up by the bootstraps and, and just use anything available. I started my programming with my phone attached to a desk lamp that was clipped onto a tripod because the tripod didn't have the right mount. I still don't have the right mount, but now I have, a, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's more important that we bring ourselves into proximity with others than we have the tech stuff down perfectly. Not to knock the tech, it's great, it's really great. And I'm excited to be learning a lot more about it. Anyway, start sorry, simple and add on. Yeah, <laughs> start with your comfort level is important. Don't feel that you have to have multiple camera angles and sound through a mixer and professional lighting and a green screen backdrop to start. Like that's maybe something you can work toward if you wanna continue virtual programming beyond the pandemic. For now, your computer, a good microphone, cause sound is important and good setup and lighting and go just start in, improvising and trying. But, but if you got a computer and a phone, multiple camera angles are really not that difficult. Because you really need the profile view as well as the head on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank you everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and start closing us out. So I want to say thank you to Gwen and Kristen. And then also thank you to Janine, uh, Sarah, Peter, Carlos, uh, we really appreciate um, all of you for sharing and presenting today. Um, and thank you to everyone for participating. I know that uh, there are several people who have been to all of our sessions so far, and we really appreciate your um, joining us. And I've been hearing a lot of really great feedback from everyone. So we, as Sarah mentioned, I'll be sharing the links that were in the chat and then also presentations uh, with everybody. Um, and then at the end of our last session, uh, we have one final session tomorrow. Um, I'll be sharing an evaluation form with everybody and we hope you'll take a few minutes to complete that. Um, tomorrow's final session is gonna be focused towards uh, teaching artists and cover adapting virtual residencies in Fairfax County middle schools. If you haven't connected to Arts Fairfax online, please follow us now. You can tag us at, at Arts Fairfax or use our hashtag, hashtag Arts Fair Facts, to continue the conversation from today. And we also wanna be sure that everyone is aware there's a second round of emergency relief and recovery grants for artists available. The deadline is October 30th and we encourage all Fairfax residents to apply. All right, and I think that closes us out. Thank you everybody. Thank Bye. you.